Hello, I'm Martin Weller, and I'm going to talk to you today about metaphors of edtech. So, first of all, about metaphors, uh, they play a very key part in our conceptual system. And I think we sort of can thank the work of Lakoff and Johnson, who wrote the book Metaphors We Live By, for really helping us reframe how we think about metaphors. Um, they're not just for poets, for, for literature. They're kind of really a very fundamental part of how we think and, and interact with the world. Metaphors have real power, so they help us understand something new, for instance. So uh, if, if there's a, a domain we don't understand, we often take a, a domain we do understand and map certain elements across to help us understand that new domain. There's also that idea of generative metaphor, where we have two different domains, there's kind of dialogue between them that helps understand both of them uh, in better detail. And I think there's also this really interesting idea that metaphors help us shape a solution. So uh, in psychology, they gave two different uh, groups of subjects uh, an account where in one crime was presented in, in terms of metaphor of a disease in a community, and another way crime was presented as a metaphor of a monster, so terrorized community. Then they asked those two different groups to come up with solutions for how to deal with the crime. And depending on which, uh, which metaphor they've been exposed to, they came up with different solutions. And so I think turning to education technology, I think there's kind of three ways I'm interested in that, that metaphors can help us. The first is this idea of just understanding something. You know, educational technology is still quite new, a new field for us, we're exploring it. We're not quite sure how different technologies impact, what they can mean for learning, what they can mean for institutions, what they can mean for education more generally. And so metaphors allow us to sort of take something we do understand and apply it to this new domain. There's also this idea of what we might call defence. I think we're going back to the idea that metaphors help us shape a solution. So often you'll see accounts uh, often from companies who are trying to sell you something or, or commentators in, a certain, uh, in certain fields, and they'll present it to you in a very powerful metaphor which then makes their solution seem like the obvious solution. I think just being aware that you're being presented with a metaphor and how to react against that is very useful. And lastly, but certainly not least, the idea of fun. Well, metaphors allow us to reason in a very kind of creative manner about technology. Often it's a very kind of dry thing, think about educational technology. I think just having some playfulness there can be very helpful. And speaking of playfulness, you can go to this site and play around with what a metaphor generator that I created that creates random. Uh, education technology metaphors for you. So if you don't like it, just click a button and get that one. And thanks to Alan Levine for helping me develop that. <clears throat> so I'm developing, a, I've written a book, sorry, uh, called Metaphors of EdTech, published by Athabasca University Press. It's openly licensed, free to download, uh, coming later this month in September. So you can go to that book and download it there. And thanks to Brian Mathers for the fantastic uh, artwork on the cover. I'm a big Jaws fan, there's a Jaws metaphor in there. Um, Part of the reason I wanted to write the book was, as well as this kind of just fun thing of exploring the ideas, was that we went through the online pivot following the pandemic when nearly all education shifted online um, and education technology moved to centre stage. But then there's also been a kind of backlash against that. So now it's like, thanks for all that work during the pandemic, but now everybody get back onto campus. And there's this kind of feeling that only the lecture is the real, real way of education, you know, what we might call a lecture deficit model for everything else, which is never as good as the lecture. So you see quotes like this one here from an article I read, saying the main reason why the distance learning education uh, didn't replace traditional model is that online learning just isn't as good. And I think what's revealed to me is a kind of real lack of alternative models that people have for thinking about education, what online education can be. They, they only have the lecture, and it's, it's never as good as the lecture. So, it's why I want to think that metaphors provide a new way to think about it. So in the book, there's a wide range of metaphors, lots of things to choose from. There's history of Welsh castles, uh, music, um, anthropology. So there'll be some there you like and there'll be some you want. There's a pick and mix. Thing. Uh, so an example of one is, uh, I won't have time to go through these in much detail, but uh, video assisted refereeing and learning analytics. So uh, video assisted refereeing came into playing football, as you may know. I think it's interesting because although it seemed inevitable that it would be used, everyone wanted it to be used, it also led to certain problems we didn't foresee. For example, the kind of really minute measurements of the computers allow to what is essentially a very human enterprise. So you get these kind of decisions where someone is ruled to be offside by like a toenail or something. And really the game was never meant to be played like that. And similarly, I think for uh, learning analytics in, in education, you can think about shifting students' performance by 0.1 uh, 
over here and doing something over there, tweaking this kind of stuff. And that's not really how education works. And I think it kind of helps and it undermines the human in the system. If you like. Uh, and so I'd like to video assisted refereeing. And I'm not saying it's not going to be implemented. Uh, learn that it's, I think, just um, is again, seems inevitable. But it needs to be implemented very kind of sympathetically, I think. Uh, the VLE is uh, an area that's rich for metaphors, and a paper here by Farrelly, Costello, and Donlon looked at the different types of metaphors. They analysed different papers and, and the kind of underlying metaphors that people use to talk about VLEs. I think that's interesting because depending on your, your kind of subconscious metaphor about a VLE, it will affect how you interact with it. Uh, another kind of common uh, metaphor we have is whatever the latest technology is, the, the latest Silicon Valley business model, people say, let's apply that to education. So we've had Uber for education, Netflix for learning, Airbnb, all these kind of things. And it's tied up this idea of unbundling off things or taking the different elements of education apart. It's the idea will be, oh, just like you can ring a taxi or order a taxi by your mobile phone, you can just get some learning as you need it from people out there. The, these metaphors usually very conveniently ignore all of the quite dodgy labour practices and, and business models of these, of these organisations. But more importantly, they also ignore why this model is not like education. So if we take Uber, you know, it's essentially getting a taxi ride. That's a very short term thing. Compare that with education, which is often a very long time frame to action. Uh, education is very diverse geographically and by discipline, whereas getting a taxi is pretty similar wherever you go. Uh, being licensed off a formal credit is a very complex process. There's only one with a driving license can become an Uber driver. And the idea of Mino's paradox, where as a learner, you don't know what it is that you need to know, whereas you know what it is you want from a taxi driver. Uh, Learning is often a social activity, whereas you know, getting a taxi is often a solitary one. And education is already engaging with online learning and mobile delivery, so it's not clear what they're trying to solve here. So I think just it's worth questioning when you're presented with these kind of quite powerful metaphors. Um, and that leads me to think about the, the dangers of metaphors. They are very powerful. And that's part of their, their attractiveness, but also it leads you to think that they can be, you can be manipulated in certain ways with them. They often go unnoticed. So they're kind of, so it's presented in a metaphor with a very obvious solution and you don't realise it before you've, you've signed up to whatever that solution is. They can also exclude certain groups. I mean, one of the power of them is that if you all get what the metaphor is, then it helps you understand the new domain. But if you're, if you don't know that initial met metaphor, it can make you feel even more confused. You know, so if I was to use a metaphor of a, a children's TV program in the UK in the 80s, now certain people would get that, but other people would feel completely excluded by the use of that metaphor. Um, they're, they're imperfect, you know, they're not the same as the target domain, otherwise they would be that target domain. So you need to always be careful of which bits don't map across. Uh, and I think almost for any metaphor, you could find one that says the completely opposite thing for, for what you're trying to claim. So always just be aware of that, I think. What they do allow, I think, is kind of an element of creativity and playfulness. So often when we interact with educators, technology, it's bound up in spreadsheets and roadmaps for implementation, all those kind of things. But I think there's kind of room for creative thinking there also. And I think just thinking about a metaphor and how it makes us relate to a different technology kind of makes us, makes us think in a kind of a more critical manner. What is this technology doing for us? What can it do for our learners? Uh, what, why is it like this thing? Why is it not like this thing? And I think that also helps humanise our relation with technology. By using metaphors that are of mean, meaningful to us or to our, our groups, then it makes us think about this technology in a different way. And it also just encourages discussion. If everyone has a discussion about technology, just propose a metaphor and someone will come along and tell you why your metaphor is completely rubbish or extend it in kind of ways that you hadn't uh, anticipated. So you might want to think, you know, in your institution, alongside all those very formal things you do, stakeholder engagements, rollout plans, those kind of things, why not run some metaphor workshops? Why is the thing we're developing like this or not like this? So thank you for listening. Uh, enjoy the conference. It's, I can't be there, I'm afraid, but I'm sure you have a great time. And you might just want to think um, for yourself, what role of metaphor, those three that I mentioned, understanding, defence, creativity is most meaningful for you? Uh, and how might you use metaphor in your practice? And I hope you enjoy the book and uh, feel free to download it or play with the metaphor generator uh, later on. Thanks.